What if I told you one of the best war games ever made was released 56 years ago? 7 years before D&D, 16 years before 40k, and 38 years before YouTube, there was only Feudal. Feudal is a chess-like tabletop game that can be played by 2-6 to six players. Each player commands an army of 13 troops and sets out to capture the enemy castle or kill their royal bloodline. Unlike chess where you move one piece before your opponent gets to go, you move all of them, making this game focus heavily on troop maneuverability. The game is won or lost by whoever is able to make the best battlefield adjustments. And despite being relatively easy to find online, I knew a few improvements could help bring this 58-year-old war game into my modern board game rotation. The plastic pieces included with the original game were good for their time, but they could definitely use an update. I decided to go with Perry Miniatures and the Agincourt and War of Roses units. The Perry Brothers are X Games Workshop sculptors that make very affordable miniatures that are just as detailed as some of the leading miniature companies out there. The sprues offer a ton of options when building, making these essential for kit bashers or expanding bit boxes. Also, they're veterans of the Battle of Pelennor Fields, what's not to like? When building the armies, I didn't want them all to look the same, but wanted them to feel related. I want them to feel like they are all from the same world, but different parts of it. The Perry miniatures work as a good base, but even with the four kits I bought, there were still going to be some repeat troops. I decided to do some light kit bashing with some Vitrix Dark Age miniatures that I had lying around. I mostly swapped in some different weapons and heads, but doing something as simple as giving these troops a Norman kite shield made them stand out quite a bit from the different armies. Another thing I did was go through my Warhammer Bitbox. A lot of the old fantasy kits, also sculpted by the Perry Brothers, have a bunch of small detail pieces, like these moons from some old high elves. Adding these to horses and helmets, an entire army of movement were created. It's pretty fun to see how far you can push these sets, like this pirate king I made using a viking head, dwarven flag, and, and re-sculpted sword arm. You can do more extreme kit bashing if you use a type of epoxy clay, like green stuff, milliput, or in this case, epoxy sculpt. The main purpose is to fill in gaps between bits that don't quite fit together. Or if you're feeling bold, you can sculpt new ones. I wanted an army to be like woodland hunters who wear pelts that are totally different from the Starks, okay? So some fur collars were made with a small piece of epoxy sculpt that was poked and prodded with my needle tool until it made something that looked like fur. I'm pretty happy with how these turned out, and they look even better painted. Now there's one piece in the original feudal game called the Squire, and they're able to move like a knight in chess. But their piece looks like this medieval peasant boy, and those are kind of hard to come by at a 28mm scale, so I decided to instead make bannermen. I just needed to make the banners. Using polystyrene sheets, a flag shape was cut out to fit on the soldier's spear. Then using tweezers, the flag is held over a large paper clip and held over a candle. The polystyrene is so thin that the heat from the candle is able to warp it and make it look like a waving flag. The paper clip is to help fold over the polystyrene into a loop that can be glued onto the spear. Using this method, I was able to make these different types of banners. Some are even topped with spear bits to add in even more detail. To finish these troops off, I used some base ready from Geek Gaming Scenix. and painted the rims of the bases and added these marks to help tell the pieces apart. I could have used my Song of Ice and Fire's miniatures or other ones I had lying around, but I enjoyed just doing this, coming up with my own armies, painting them the way I wanted them to, not having to worry about if they match a corporate IP or didn't have an entire fan base worrying about if you painted them right. Now that troops are finished, I can start on the battlefield. <laughs> To create the board, there were a few ways I could have done this, but I decided to go with wood. Starting with a foot and a half by six foot board of paneled pine, this would allow the four boards to be 18 inch squares. But the board wasn't exactly 18 inches wide, and it had to be shortened to 17 inches on a table saw. Each of the four boards for Feudal have a 12 by 12 movement grid. The original has holes and the figures are on pegs, but to accommodate my new miniatures I went for a checkerboard design. But that caused a problem because 17 divided by 12 equals... 1 and 5 twelves, which doesn't show up on most rulers, 
especially the American kind, so I made my own in Photoshop and printed it out. I gave myself a few extra on the page in case I got messed up or ruined. Board. Paper ruler was taped down and using a speed square straight edge. The lines were continued with a pencil on both sides of the board. This gave me a correct sided grid that I could check to make sure it lines up with the other boards before moving on to the next step. To create the grooves to separate the squares, I'll be using my circular saw with its plunge depth set low just to scratch the surface of the wood. The saw is kept straight by clamping the wood down along with the speed squares and a ruler. I double, triple, quadruple check that the saw is lined up with my pencil guide and slowly cut the wood. Working from left to right, eventually I ran out of room and had to work from the other side. Then the entire process was completed for the horizontal lines. Now through the power of editing, this comes across as something that was done relatively quickly, but each board took about two and a half hours to completely cut. But taking the extra time to double check edges was completely worth it. The next step was to make the different types of squares on the boards, mountains and rough terrain. The location of the terrain is marked with painter's tape. This allowed me to cover any knots or areas in the wood I didn't like. The rough terrain is represented by these squiggly marks that were first drawn out in pencil, then carved into the board with my woodcut tools. All of the boards were then sanded with my orbital sander, working my way up from 120 grit to 220 grit, and not forgetting to sand the sides. When all the boards were sanded, they were stained with a dark green wood stain. I was worried it would be too dark, so it was thinned with some water. This works since the stain is water-based. It just had to be poured into a different container so I wouldn't affect the entire pot. The stain is painted onto the boards, and the excess is wiped away with a rag. The stain dried way too dark, and at this point, I thought I had ruined everything. So I quickly sanded them again, and luckily was able to remove the majority of the stain. There were a few areas where it just couldn't get removed, but it added this vintage age effect to the board, and I'm going to pretend like that was the plan all along, and we will never speak of this again. The stain did work perfectly, however, for the impassable mountain ranges. It was painted on carefully with a small synthetic brush. The boards were given about two days to completely dry before a clear satin polycrylic was applied. Since both the poly and the stain are water-based, they could run if the stain was not given enough time to dry. I ended up giving each board five coats of polycrylic and sanding with 220 grit in between each coat for a super smooth finish. I'm happy with how the boards turned out, and I'm not going to beat myself up too much about the stain stains I couldn't remove. I'm not the best at working with wood. And the fact I was able to make 88 straight cuts without messing up is better than some decolorization in a few areas. So it's time to move on. One of the ways you win in Feudal is by capturing the other player's castle. The original game has these Lego brick looking plastic pieces that the units can be placed in. I will need to make bigger ones to fit my new units and the enlarged board. Using one of the rulers from earlier, I cut this piece of scrap chipboard to size. The castles will be sculpted from plastiline clay. This clay never dries, and I'm using it because I plan on casting my sculptures. Plastiline clay comes in varying degrees of hardness. I like using harder clay because it retains detail really well. It's just really hard to work with. Thankfully, it can be heated up and melted to become more malleable. In this case, I used a hair dryer for a few minutes to make it soft. The melted clay is still hot, and to not burn myself, I decided to cut some square dowels to work as the castle wall turrets. The warm clay is spread out over the chipboard and into the basic castle shape I wanted. The bases that I used on my troops are pressed in to make sure they will fit in the finished castles. Before the clay cooled down and rehardened, the wooden dowels were pressed into the four corners of the castle wall, along with two more to work as a gatehouse. I left the clay in the fridge for a bit before sculpting the fine details like the door and the wall crenelles. The castles actually take up two squares, and the flat part is called the castle green. Troops can occupy it, but you do not win until you enter the castle itself. A simple brick texture and staircase were carved in to give it some more detail. Throughout the sculpting process, my hands would heat up the clay, and it would have to be returned to the fridge for a few minutes to make sure that the details wouldn't get squashed. This is what the castle looked like when I was finished sculpting, and I made a second one with rounded dowels for variety. Next, I'm using Leftover Moldstar 16 Fast from last year 
to make a mold. Hopefully I have enough. A cardboard box is built around the castle. This will hold the silicone in place. Each part of the silicone is equally measured out and mixed together. I have to work relatively quickly since I have a short pot life, but I make up for it with a fast cure time. The silicone is poured into the mold box and left to cure. After about 45 minutes, the mold box can be broken down and the clay sculpture can be removed. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough to mold the second castle. I now have an empty mold that I can cast as many castles as I need. And to do that, I'll be using plaster Paris. A two to one mixture of plaster and water is mixed together and mixed together thoroughly to get rid of any lumps. Then slowly pour it into the mold. About halfway in, the mold can be lightly shaken to force any ear bubbles to the surface. Then the rest of the plaster is poured in. A few more castles were made than I needed in case any broke during the next steps. Using a wet piece of sandpaper, the plaster castles were evened out and cleaned up. Using wet sandpaper keeps plaster dust from going everywhere. For painting, the main color of each faction was selected and mixed with gray to desaturate it, and the entire piece was painted. When the paint dried, I stained it with Agrax Earthshade. And once the stain dried, the castles were covered in a clear epoxy resin. This will help make the plaster stronger, as well as give them a shiny polished stone look when they are on the board. When coating everything in resin, I covered my work area with parchment paper. This is one of the few things that resin doesn't stick to and makes cleanup a lot easier. The resin took about a day to dry, but when they were finished, they each stood out and fit the units from the game perfectly. With the castles complete, I think this project is done. The painted miniatures, oversized board, and upgraded castles help bring this vintage game into the modern day and earns it a spot on my gaming shelf. If you made it this far, thanks for watching me talk about a game older than the internet. And if you can think of any other great old games that could use a facelift, let me know in the comments below.